Welcome to Feminism Today, everyone. I'm Sophia Johnson in New York. It's been 25 years since literary titan Toni Morrison became the first and only Black woman to receive a Nobel Prize in literature, and 35 years since Alice Walker became the first Black woman to receive the 1983 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for the color purple. Many top literary prizes nom nominate Black women, but few of those women have actually won awards. And Glory Edeem wants to change that. She's published a new book, an anthology of legendary Black authors titled On Girlhood, 15 stories from the well-read Black girl library. From recognized novelists to lesser known voices, the collection celebrates the voices of Black women in literature and features short stories that explore the thin yet imperative line between Black girlhood and womanhood. Gloria Deem, welcome to Feminism Today. Hello, thank you for having me. You started the book with Jamaica Kincaid's Girl, in which a mother offers fierce instructions to her impressionable daughter. Why did you use it and what does it mean to you? Well, that story was such a formative story in my own childhood, and I could recognize the tenor of the mother's voice that you know, that aching of like, you need to do the right thing. You need to be the right person. Let me impart all this wisdom and let me share my lessons with you. And I can recall being the daughter, being impressionable and mm -hmm. wide eyed and just like listening to my mom. Mm -hmm. And Jamaica Kincaid has such a beautiful voice. When it comes to her writing, it is just legendary. And that story felt like the perfect way to start this collection and looking at Black girlhood, what it sounds like when we're listening to our inner voice, when we're listening to our mothers, our sisters, mm -hmm. our grandmothers. And I wanted that to kind of kick off the collection as an opening um, story to just invite the reader in. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. I just was telling you off camera that I've had an amazing reading experience. I'm thinking also about the literary experiences that gave the writers in the book the confidence to tell their stories. Uh, I tell my students all the time that Confidence is the stuff of success. It, it, it gives us strength um, and it gives us all the stuff that we need to accomplish anything that we want. How did you decide on which authors made the cut? Uh, what type of questions were you looking to get answered in this book? Oh, yes. I There were so many stories. When I looked at my original list, I had over like 600 stories. And I always tell people this is just a beginning. It's only 15 stories, but there's so many things to explore when it comes to the canon of literary Black women. Mm -hmm. um, I was really looking at stories that had a nuance and a very sharp perspective when it comes to who these young women are, mm -hmm. and they feel unconventional, yeah. and they have a, a sense of just, um, again, that inner dialogue. You know, I was like looking at sentence structure, I was looking at the feeling of girlhood and coming of age stories, and I knew immediately like stories like Alice Walker's Everyday Use. I knew that story had to be in, in the collection. Yeah. Um, and then there were other stories like Camille Acker's beautiful story where she was part of the well Black Girl ecosystem. And her story, you know, it spoke to me because I'm originally from Washington, D.C. and A lot of her stories take place in the D.C. area. And so I was really following my intuition and my love for stories. And I'm trying to find like things that were unexpected and mm -hmm. fresh. Yeah, it's absolutely uh, stunning what you've done with this second book, but you know, what, you, what you're basically doing with, um, uh, with Well Read Black Girl. But besides the theme of girlhood identity in this book, uh, this book is also about life transitions. That's where I am and that's what I took away. Uh, the desire to emerge fully uh, present and to be seen in, um, in this truth. Um, and for your truth, as a Nigerian American woman, how did you learn to push past social stereotypes? Um, uh, what is your coming of age story? 
Yes, that's a wonderful question. Uh, you mentioned earlier this idea of having confidence. I feel like my parents instilled a lot of confidence in me, but that was also paired with this idea of being community oriented and collaborating with people and cultivating a sense of self through like good work and good deeds, like really yeah. going out there. That's part of my coming of age story, really finding myself, understanding my heritage, um, understanding it in the context of being you know, a first generation. Nigerian American and yeah. making sure that I'm being authentic and honest with my story. Yeah. And th that story is also full of lots of mistakes and yeah. rejections and failures, but that doesn't diminish my value. That still makes me a worthy person. And I think that it's so important. And, and in the collection, I try to share these stories that have a lot of complex uh, themes and ideas. It's not just one-sided. Um, and I think we need more coming of age stories, especially of for young black girls and young uh, girls of color to see that there's not to steer away from perfection and just to be yourself, be your whole self yeah. and be honest with yourself. And you can still succeed in all amounts of ways. You know, yeah. there's not a clear pathway to success. It's all about being yourself and being a, living a full life. And yeah. I try to really um, embark that in the literature and the festival. Yeah the organization, tell your story and own it and be honest with it. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the organization, uh, about why you decided to build a community around Black women and literature, meeting the moment as we talked a little bit about. You wrote on social media, on Twitter, um, Black girls deserve to feel free um, and loved always. Um, and you've said elsewhere in other um, publications, books are the foundation of the community you've built around well-read uh, Black girl, um, um, and but so is activism. Is reading a form of activism? Yes, yes. I feel wholeheartedly that reading is a form of activism, It's but it's what you do after you do the reading. You have to really figure out how to you know, put these daily practices into your life. So if you want to read about anti-racism, how do you actually activate that in your community? How do you change policies? How do you become a full citizen? Mm -hmm. So I think reading is essential, but it's the first step. It is not the only step. It's the yeah. first step to becoming a um, person who is engaged in their community and they want to make change and reading because we have so much access to technology yes we have books but we have the internet and we have social media we have all these tools at our disposal how do you use it for good and really make a, a impact in your community so i i strongly believe that i've seen i've witnessed it i went to howard university in washington dc a historically yeah. black college and the books i read on that campus went on to influence how I move in the world. Mm. It went on to influence this organization. Um, and I know that was, again, the first step of my journey. Can you give us some, give the viewers some ideas, some samples of some books that really inspired um, and activated this sort of social consciousness for you? Oh, I, without question, uh, Their Eyes Are Watching God, Zora Neale Hurston is my forever muse. I love her work and I love her spirit and tenacity. Mm -hmm. And I always think about the things she did and the audacity she had during, in the time period, you know, like it's it's one thing to do something now in 2021. When she was during the Harlem Renaissance, mm -hmm. when she was making these incredible bold moves and statements, it was not welcomed it was it was met with controversy but she still did it and she lived her own life even when she was faced with really crucial consequences and i think looking at her life and reading her work really influenced me to feel braver and to take risks and to not be afraid of failing you know like you have to like take a risk on yourself and, and on your dreams brilliant now not only do black women authors um find themselves being uh, locked out of mainstream audiences. Oftentimes, uh, they're left out of conversations um, around classic novels uh, within genres like fantasy, horror, mm -hmm. science fiction, romance, and even cooking, um, which we do a lot of. <laughs> Why do you think Black women authors are not recognized in all literary genres? 
I think there is a, a need for it to change just the industry of publishing. There's, you know, oftentimes we think of only the author and the bookstore, but there is a whole ecosystem behind it. So I think we need more, you know, black editors. We need more, you know, folks that can be behind the scenes that impact these decisions and kind of take away these barriers mm -hmm. because they exist. There are phenomenal writers across genres that have like their books ready. And not only are they ready, they're excellent quality. And so I think it's just changing, you know, this idea of if there can only be one, that we can have multitudes of incredible writers at the forefront, you know, sharing mysteries and science fiction and cooking books and everything. Like there's not a, um, a small window there. It's, it's actually quite large and there needs to be lots of sunlight coming in. Um, I, it's, it's, it's challenging, but I know it's possible because the work exists and it needs to be like amplified. Right. Now, many Black women um, authors are also left out of spaces that include literary giants and thinking yes. about, in, especially um, in, in the feminist discourse. Um, what can Black women writers do to break those barriers? I think it's really important to cite other Black women and do this collective sharing and going online. Luckily, we have, again, these tools at our disposal. So when you read something that you're excited about, like that word of mouth sharing, going to the library and saying, can you, you know, put this book in the library? Can we order at the bookstore? Showing up in those numbers, it makes a difference. Requesting a book, pre-ordering a book, like buying it in advance before the book hits, you know, the shelf on its sale date, all those things do make an incredible impact and they make a difference in the life of the author and the writer. So I think those are tools that we can do. Um, and we are a collaborative spirit. I feel like that is a part of our our calling and our ethos to be generous. So, you know, spending your, your money wisely and investing in local bookstores as well yeah. is another way to help um, Black women to continue to succeed in this field. Let's talk a little bit about... Uh... Gloria Jean Watkins. Last week, we lost trailblazing scholar and activist yes. Gloria Jean Watkins, who wrote under the pen name Bell Hooks. Yes. Um, as a tribute to her grandmother, she wrote under this uh, pen name. Uh, she made her final transition to the ancestors. Yes. Uh, she built a community around Black women in literature. What does she mean to you? Um, and how did her writing transform your life? Wow, that is such that's such a phenomenal question. For for me, Bell Hooks really taught me um, this idea of loving yourself and loving your own genius and understanding the power of your intellect. Without her wisdom and her words, I would not be able to give myself the um, the credit. You know, she made it known that she valued her own self and she understood the power of her words. And by her modeling that, I think so many women, especially Black women, were able to just see themselves and mm -hmm. understand the power of their, their own storytelling. Um, and she just was so, so incredibly brilliant. Like I've read, you know, All About Love and Salvation and um, Sisters of the Yam, like all of these books mm. imparted so much knowledge and allowed me to see myself more clear and have a healthy understanding of who I was becoming. You know, one of the things I like about On Girlhood is that it, 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 it's, it made me still for a moment because I went into this reading and thinking to myself, you know, I, I'm, I'm tapping into genius, but I'm, I'm sort of looking at how they were able to focus and center themselves and be grounded in their truth in the midst of turbulent times because it travels, the stories travel across decades, yeah. right? Across a century. Mm -hmm. And at every point as I'm reading it, I'm also doing a Google and saying what was happening in 1928, what was happening yeah. in 1935, and how did they overcome, right? Um, I, one of the books I constantly refer to um, in terms of bell hooks is Ain't I a Woman, yeah. right? Every time I feel, you know, something weird going on, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, Ain't I a Woman too? And so I wonder if you've read Ain't I a Woman and what, you know, what would you share with audiences about the power of her work in particular in this body of work, Anti Woman, if you've read it. Yes, I have read it. And I, I again, that centering and that being clear on who you are, yeah. and not letting others 
change that perspective of you coming yeah. back to center, being clear and focused about your worth and your audacity and your boldness. I think all of these legendary foremothers have given us that gift. It's, it's almost an offering of you can do this. You can tell your own story. You can be clear in your intentions and in your hopes, your dreams and not need validation from any other person. Sure. And I think that is what resonates with me when I read that work. It's like, come back to self. Yeah. Know who you are. Know your goals. Know your dreams very clearly. Yeah. Um, and again, Bell Hooks has been able to do that for me. And she continues to bring forth the other literary, uh, like not even just literary, historians, these iconic wow. figures. Like she calls on Sojourner Truth. She calls on Morrison. She calls on the people, her peers and people that inspired her. And mm -hmm. we can do that with one another. We can call on each other when we need support and uplift. Yeah, yeah. Uh, talking about the reach and the extent to which, you know, she, you know, there's a there's, there's a collective uh, around her work. During the Black arts movement in the 1960s, Black women writers were freely um, speaking on topics like racism, classism, sexism. Do you see any parallels with the Black arts movement to uh, Black women writers today? Oh, yes, 100 percent. Because we what I found, at least with within my organization, it's like there is a call and response. We are responding to the things that happened in the past. And there and unfortunately, there are these issues that you named are still happening. There's so many that we, we're at a crisis when it comes to racism and white supremacy and patriarchy and capitalism all things that these incredible activists had to address during the Black Arts Movement. Mm -hmm. And um, it hasn't stopped. So yes, the tactics and the, the tools on how we address things have changed because of social media and technology to a certain extent, but the issue, the core issues are still here and they still need to be unpacked and explored and even um, addressed even more aggressively, you know, because I think that there is like this almost, we're over inundated with with technology and knowledge. Like, how do we get back to how how do we actually find resolve and ch make change? Yeah. Um, and I, another thing I think of when I think about the movements is this idea of continuing to be hopeful. There's a lot of things that we could be deterred and despondent about, mm -hmm. but this idea of being encouraged and hoping for a better future. If Even if we don't see it in our lifetime, there we need go. to hope for future generations and to think that the, the life that we want to live is possible. Mm -hmm. And I really attribute that to the movements of the past. When I think of the civil rights movement, when I think right. of the black arts movement, there is a hope and there's a tenacity to keep going forward. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. And especially for me becoming a parent, you start to think to yourself, okay, I'm not gonna get to the promised land. I might not get there, not today, but I'm gonna put my money on it for you guys, right? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm a mother as well. And I, I, de I deeply, deeply think in that perspective because I want the best for my son. I want the best for your, your children as well. Like we need to think about a brighter future. Yeah. Now, Glory, what authors help you think about your identity and your place in the world as a writer? Oh, I absolutely love this. The list is endless. It really, truly is. I love Morrison. I love Walker. I love Maya Angelou. I like all, all these incredible women. I think the um, I'm thinking more and more about Toni Cade Bambara as of lately mm -hmm. and thinking about her work as a, um, a cultural worker, as a playwright, as a, a woman of so many different modes. And I like to, to think of the work that I'm doing is, a cultural worker like I like to work in different mediums and spaces yeah. but I really like to be very hands-on and grassroots like I want to be in spaces where there's it's accessible and people can talk to me and reach me and yeah. you know, uh, be very close because I think there's something that happens when you can have one-on-one -on -one contact when you have real conversations when you can look someone in the eye yeah. uh, th that's when transformation happens you know and it's a little bit slower at times yeah. um, but that this idea of planting seeds i was i'm very inspired by tony k Bambara's work and how she was able to do that and, and her bravery yeah yeah absolutely when did you learn that you weren't just a reader um an observer um but also a writer with something impactful to contribute to the discourse? I um, I was a journalism major and I, I loved reading um, stories and 
you know, through creative writing and obviously like nonfiction books as well and memoirs. Um, but I think something probably sh that shifted once I graduated and I was like in the real world, world per se. Yeah. And it made me, I felt more enticed to just like write everything down and to be like actually write down my observations and experiment with form. And so, you know, I, I tried my hand at writing a novel and I, I wrote some plays, and I wrote some poems and I wasn't um, afraid to like write something and not it and not have it like be out for consumption. It wasn't necessarily for others. It was just for myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that creative practice uh, allowed me for when it was time to like share it with the audience and write the anthology and do all this research. I, I had practice. I had a lot of time with myself trying to figure out what my voice was. Um, and I also feel like these anthologies really embody the community work I'm doing. It's like I'm gathering these incredible stories in order to share them with other people and have conversations and talk about different ideas and even look how literature is um, part of like, you know, political movements and, you know, identity building. It's, it's such a fortifying feeling to see other people respond and read and have the same reactions I'm having or sometimes completely opposite reactions but either way it, it does provoke feeling and emotion and that's a beautiful thing to witness. For sure. I've read that you're a big journaler. You're journal and you've been journaling for a while. How long have you been journaling? Um, when is it true and how long have you been journaling and what can you tell our younger audiences about the importance of this sort of reflective experience? Yes, I, it is true. I journal. I've been journaling since I was like 10 years old. Wow. <laughs> like, I have journals upon journals. And one thing, um, again, that, that perfection of voice, like that finding your voice, I can see it in the pages of my journal. I can see like, the silly things I was writing about. And, you know, sometimes they're completely nonsensical. And I could also see when I was like really, you know, formulating like real opinions about you know, politics and like forming my ideology. Like I was, I can see the growth and it's yeah. just so amazing to look back at your younger self. And, you know, sometimes you're giving yourself a round of applause and then sometimes yeah. you're just like cringing. At the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is, it is very rewarding to kind of just look at, look back and have a reflection of who the, who you were. Yeah. Um, and even now I'm doing it now I'm in this new phase of motherhood. My son is still very young and I'm even, I'm writing letters to him and thinking about who he will be when he gets older and hopefully he'll read them and see them. And yeah. I think it's just important for, for young people to do that. Like write down your ideas and don't yeah. be afraid of who, who you're becoming. Yeah. Yeah. I've read that you were also working on a memoir. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm working on a memoir and those journals have come in handy. I bet. I bet. <laughs> yes. So it's really looking at the intersection of, um, of writing and my heritage. And again, this idea of becoming the person I want to be. And I'm, I would give so much credit to my parents and our experiences um, as a family, being first generation, um, it's really important to me. And uh, I, I love, I love my family so much. So a lot of it is about like my family, my mom, like teaching me how to read and how, you know, we had a, a moment in our life where my mom was depressed and it had, it had ripple effects on our family. And we really turned to reading as a, a sense of therapy, but also this kind of salvation. It like, really brought us together when we had, we were dealing with these very intense problems. Um, and in the midst of that, I was like becoming a young woman, you know, so I write all about that and just how the books in my library kind of shaped my perspective as I was growing up. Very nice. Let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, let's go back to the anthology for a moment. The book ends with an essay by Zora Neale Hurston titled, How It Feels to Be Colored Me originally published in 1928. Could you read for us the second paragraph on page 181? Oh, yes, I would love to. That essay is full of so much strength and love. And there's here is this uh, passage. But I am not tragically colored. There is no great sorrow damned up in my soul, nor lurking behind my eyes. I do not mind at all. I do not belong to the sobbing school of Negrohood who hold that nature somehow has given them a low down dirty deal and whose feelings are all but about it. Even in the helter skelter squirmish that is my life, 
I have seen that the world is to the strong, regardless of a little pigmentation, more or less. No, I do not weep at the world. I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. Glory, I read this at least 10 times over and over. The first time I read it, it brought tears to my eyes. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to cry, but it is, it is, this is, it sort of carries us through the, the, the anthology starts with the advice of the mom, right? Yeah. And mom gives you advice, but you, it, it cannot protect you from the winds of the, the storms of the world. And so you go out into the world. And in the final analysis, Zora gives us this. Yes. How did you decide on this? Why did you do this to me? <laughs> you know, and thank you for doing this to me. But what did you want readers to take away from this final essay? Yeah, for me, it was it was so hard to narrow these essays down. Like I promise you, like it was it was incredibly different difficult because there were so many stories I wanted to include, so many perspectives, especially because the essay is divided into, you know, it's into different themes around like belonging, identity, yeah. love, and it goes across decades. But I wanted to close with this idea of like, you have the power, you have the oyster knife. Mm -hmm. It is for you to explore and to unpack and investigate your own self. And you don't have, and even this essay, it's it's a very controversial essay by Zorna. Oh, yeah. Like there's so many ideas about that that statement about the pigmentation and this idea of kind of you know being the sobbing school you know if there's but again you get to interrogate that the meaning behind that and you get to make the decision on who you are and your identity and mm -hmm. all of the stories throughout the collection have that sharpness and have that real clear intellect of I get to decide and no one else. And I hope that is what the, the reader takes away. And they are inspired by Zora Neale Hurston, but they're also inspired by all the authors in the collection for to them to cultivate their own beautiful sense of self. What's next for Well-Read Black Girl community? Um, I'm curious about the diaspora, the diaspora, um, you know, Blacks in the diaspora. I myself from Toronto, so I called up, of course, I called up my sisters and say, hey, have you heard of? So I'm just wondering, how are you building out this community? What, what, um, what spaces, what countries? I mean, how are you sort of building it out? What's the next step? Yes, I, well, I'm looking to go global and I'm looking to expand things and I have a new podcast coming out. So there's going to be the Well-Read Black Girl podcast that launches on February 1st of 2022. Mm -hmm. So I'm super excited by that. So people can listen to conversations. I'll be in conversations with some incredible authors like Toronto Burke and Minjin Lee. Um, I'm so excited about that so people can listen because there's one thing to read but it's also to be in conversation and hear the voices and get advice about craft and creative process you know so we're just going to continue to deep deep dig deeper into the process of what writing looks like and how it feels for us and how we can continue to like build our stories Gloria Dean, thank you so much for joining us this week and that's it for our program today remember you can follow me and the show on instagram or twitter Thank you so much for watching Feminism Today on Free Speech TV. Join us again next week.